Yeah, so it was terrible. Um, our first night of the trip, um, I started to get a headache. And by the next day, I realized it was not going away. So I ended up taking a COVID test and tested positive. The rest of the group did test negative, thankfully. So um, they were able to enjoy most of the trip. But when it came to us going to um, the site where they were doing the repatriation at, since we had all been exposed, we could not come into direct contact with anybody that was working with the Army or with the um, US Army cemeteries, um, simply because we cannot afford to get anybody else sick. There were other elders that were going as well to do the repatriations and they were willing to work with us. I mean, they had a full itinerary planned out for us and we had a lot to look forward to that we ended up having to drop, but they did work with us and allow us to at least stand along the fence. Um, last minute when we found out that we couldn't be there to actually recover our ancestors' remains, we did have some relatives that happened to be in DC on a separate trip so they were about two or three hours out the army really did work with us to get their background clearances completed and you know kind of get them pushed through so that they could at least be present so thankfully everybody was there or else none of this would have happened the um way that it did it would have made it far more difficult but even after all of that when we pulled the ancestors remains out of the ground um we found out that it wasn't him, so that was terrible. One, just grateful that we could be there in any capacity. This is work that we've been doing for over a year, so um, myself and Amber, we were really looking forward to it as well as the other people in our group, but we were able to show up full force. Luckily, it was my dad and my uncle that were there doing the um, disinternment. And they upheld our family and represented us really well, did all of the work in the way that we had planned on doing it anyhow. And um, that was just perfect. And even being up against the fence line with myself and Amber, Ramona, Amber's daughter and my husband it, um, was very nice to actually be there and be present. Very sad. Um, a lot of emotions come along when you're literally pulling your ancestors remains out of the ground. I mean, that feeling is kind of indescribable to me. Um, a really out of body experience, really kind of like an out of era experience. I don't know how to explain it. It just all of that trauma from the past 127 years had just been released and on top of it to find out that it wasn't even him made it even worse. Um, that young woman was 16 to 22 years old and she was my height and my size. So it especially, it's kind of like, you know, let's take the knife and twist it kind of deal. Um, yeah, just terrible. But I was mostly grateful to have my little sister there with me and to have my little cousin or niece who is only 13 years old. I think that her youthful energy really did kind of save us during this trip. And had she not been there, there were some moments that would have been way duller um, mm -hmm. or hard to get through. But her laughter kind of saved us. <laughs> you know, it, it's surreal when you're standing there first thing um i will say the u.s army uh cemeteries was very very accommodating um even even given the circumstances they were more than willing to work with us and and try to make uh make do with the situation and and yes we were um a lot of the things that we had planned we weren't able to follow through with but i i also feel like things happen the way that they're supposed to and I had kind of mentioned previously that um, this was a hard trip, you know, every step of the way, all the way from uh, leaving, leaving home, uh, nothing really went smoothly. It felt as though everything was kind of against the grain. And so um, 
you know, but it was still a beautiful trip. It, you know, we are more than prepared for when they do find Eddie. We do know what to expect from from this point forward. Um, and we just, you know, have hope that that we'll be bringing him home soon. There's a lot of emotions and mainly sadness for him that he was all the way on the other side of America, uh, the United States knowing he came from here and he was my age when he went over there pretty much so um it I don't it's hard for me to explain how I felt it was sad getting to Carlisle and seeing all those graves that they're just left there and I just feel bad I don't really know how to explain it We had a lot of conversations. I know Ramona and I had some conversations as well about um, making that trip over there in that era and what that must have been like for him as a young man, as a young person. Um, he was 16 years old when he was brought over there by our by our Indian agent. And I think that was one of the conversations that I had with Ramona and, and Nicole is like, imagine mm -hmm. how hard of a trip that must have been, you know, whether you're on train, whether you're you know, by horse, however it was that they got them there and, and riding by train was not an easy thing in that day. There wasn't, you know, bathrooms and there wasn't, you know, really places of comfort. And when you're talking about an indigenous person, um, they weren't necessarily recognized as U.S. citizens. So you imagine where he must have had to sit on the train on the way over there. And it's just heartbreaking. And um, so those were a lot of the conversations we had really trying to put ourselves in his shoes um, with what he was experiencing going over there. Everything just kind of felt off. Um, after we did the disinternment, I was in a mood that I can't really describe. And I know we keep saying it's indescribable, but it really kind of is. Um, yeah, I was probably as moody as I've ever been. I had all of those emotions that I did not know what to do with. Um, there's really no right way to heal or to process any of this. And then, so to get the news that next morning and for it to be something we were prepared for, but not really expecting, it was just heartbreaking and boarding school trauma and its fullest effect. I mean, then I was far away from home and out of my comfort and kind of just feeling that pain that he must have felt and that I know his mother felt. I mean, I was away from my kids at that point for like eight or nine days. And after I got that news, I just, I wanted to hold them. So I am, I imagine the feeling that his mom had, you know, waiting 127 years. And I had made this promise to her that I will bring her son home. And, um, for that young woman as well, when we found out that she was 16 to 22 years old and she now does not have a name and her body was completely, you know, thrown into a grave that wasn't hers and disregarded as if nobody was ever going to come back for either of those kids or any of those kids. Um, really just heartbreaking. And we went there with the intention and with the thought that we would bring our ancestor back and we came back and now we're mourning both of these children. And I feel, and I think my auntie and my cousin feel the same way. Like we love that little girl the same way we would have loved our own children and cared for her and sent her back into the ground with as much dignity as we possibly could. Um, literally, gave her the clothes that I brought with me. We sent her down with some medicines and some good prayers and some good thoughts. And I'm just heartbroken for the both of them. And I hope that she can find her way home as well um, because she's waiting. All of those kids are waiting. I think they have eight or nine graves at Carlisle that currently say unknown. Um, and those children, they really get me because they have spirits of their own and minds of their own and people of their own. And imagine 
going from your home where everybody loves you and where you're, you know, their pride and joy and most prized possession and then taken to this boarding school where they completely strip all of those kids of everything they know. Um, I just, I could not imagine. It's unimaginable and honestly traumatizing. And I've never been more upset with the U.S. government as I was that day. So it was um, a lot and it's still a lot and something I haven't completely healed from or probably won't ever heal from. Right. She was somebody's kid. Um, and not only that, she was somebody. And um, yeah, that boarding school just completely stripped her of her dignity, of her pride. I can't imagine what those last few days were like for her and to be buried by people that she may have not even known um, or not for a long time. I mean, I really do hope that they find who that young woman is so that we could honor her by name. It was important to me because I, a lot of the work that I have done throughout my life has been with children and particularly from that age category of anywhere from 12 to 18. And the way that I love Native children, I just, every single one of them is important to me. Um, and it's honestly my proudest work is working with children and it's what I take the most pride in. Um, so to bury a native child is, it's never a good time and it never feels good. And yeah, I just wanted to honor who she was as a person and, you know, on, honor her body and send her off with some type of respect because mm -hmm. she never deserved to just have her body chucked into the ground like that. It's to my understanding that the original cemetery was moved so that they could put a parking lot in and to just completely disregard a whole entire human being you know for a parking space it's just it's atrocious and it's ugly and honestly i pray for the people who committed isn't that a crime <laughs> you know who who did that because it's it's terrible um and i couldn't imagine ever having that much ugliness or that much hate in my heart to throw an Indian child away like that. It's just terrible. That's true. So I was, I was, uh, you know, we're already researching the, the kids that are near where Eddie was buried. Um, we do know there's been some instances of, uh, headstones being swapped. So, you know, as they move forward in, in following years, um, they're able to locate other children that the headstones were just placed in the wrong spot. You know, um, I don't know if that's going to be the case for us. Um, everybody that was disinterned to the right of Eddie, I think there was four, four or five um, students that were dis that would, that were already disinterned and returned back. Um, so we have no way of knowing at that point to the right of him, uh, to the left of him, it does look like there's a young man and then uh, potentially five young women. Uh, whether or not there is or isn't, I couldn't tell you. Uh, we don't. We really don't know. But yeah, we've we've also been looking into records. I mean, sitting on the plane on the way home, researching the names of the young ladies that were next to Eddie. Um, that are still there and trying to see if we can find any information. I also, as we were there, we were taking photographs of the layout of the cemetery. They do have a, a placard that has um, the layout of the cemetery and the names. Uh, those that have been already um, sent home, there's no name, there's no information. So uh, we do have the U.S. Army the cemetery group that has already begun researching as well. Um, they made they made a promise to send Eddie home just as much as we did. And I will say that throughout this process and, and um, taking that call on FaceTime and getting the news that it wasn't him, that, you know, they were 100% knew that it was not him. Um, they were very sensitive. 
they were um, very kind. Uh, we all cried on the on the phone together. I mean, it has kind of at this point turned into anger. I think the only thing that really saves us is the fact that, I mean, I had mentioned that I was so angry at the government and um, more angry than I had ever been. But I feel kind of conflicted because at the same time, the U.S., the U.S. Um, Office of Army Cemeteries and the people that they sent have, like Amber said, been so kind and compassionate and sensitive to the situation. Um, I do believe them when they um, say they're going to fulfill that promise to bring Eddie home to us. And honestly, I respect them so much for the work that they're doing because you can tell that their heart is really in it. And, um, yeah, I'm just, what better people to work with than good-hearted people who actually would like for our ancestor to come home as well. So there's honestly so many emotions surrounding the grief right now. Um, there's anger. There's also gratitude. And also it's like when we left, kind of you know left the situation and left Pennsylvania as the flight was um taking off I kind of started to cry like we're going to have to leave our ancestor here again and not only him but that young woman and I feel like it just kind of created a bigger picture for me because um I had always felt bad for all of the kids that are at Carlisle but disturbing somebody else's remains by accident like this isn't when we had initially found out that our ancestor was at Carlisle it kind of hit me like wow this can happen to our family and it did happen to our family like we had known that we had ancestors and family members who had gone to boarding school before but to have one buried clear over at Carlisle was just devastating um and then realizing that he is literally one of hundreds and how easily forgotten he could have been. I mean, there's just so much anger and it's like you want the world to know and you want everybody to hear about it. You want people to educate themselves and educate their children. And it's like you're screaming without being heard. Um, and honestly, people will probably never hear us and that's the reality of it and honestly that's the life of an indigenous person I mean we've had so many issues within our communities and so many heartaches and losses and um yeah there's a certain grief that comes with knowing that we'll probably never be respected <laughs> and it's just it's heartbreaking and nobody is ever going to get it. And we just, I guess, have to find that comfort within each other. I think when we talk about grief, um, there's like uh, different stages of grieving. You know, you go through these different stages of grieving. And and uh, I think with our community, specifically um, our family and our other community members here and and I know it's not just a here issue. I know it's an issue everywhere, uh, but it's grief on top of grief on top of grief. And and I can tell you that uh, when we sat down and called our grandmother, who is the closest living relative to Eddie's spot, and we all just sat and cried on the phone. And um, Tiana and I really tried to stay positive and, you know, look at the bright side. Tiana had said, um, you know, well, we came here to bring Eddie home and maybe we'll we'll have an opportunity to bring uh, two children home to find their homes and and and, re, you know, return them to their people, um, Eddie included. But, you know, our grandma said, hopefully it happens in your lifetime. And it it's one of those things where, you know, when you grieve, there's supposed to be a time of healing. And I think at this point, there's not going to be a time of healing until Eddie's return to us. So 
that's kind of where I'd like to close is that, you know, yes, we still cry. We still, we still, you know, over a hundred years later are grieving what happened to our people because there's never really been a reconciliation. Nobody ever said, we're sorry this happened. You know, yes, the, you know, we appreciate Deb Holland and the work that she's done. Um, with identifying these cemeteries and a lot of that work, I mean, they're across the nation. Folks are finding their relatives that they had no idea were in boarding schools and may have died in boarding schools. Um, but there's so much more work to be done.